করতেছিলাম আমাকে তখন আচ্ছা আজকে আমাদের স্পিকার আবু সাইদ সাইফুল্লাহ ও হচ্ছে 97 ব্যাচ সি বোর্ড সি এস 97 ব্যাচ ওর সাথে দীর্ঘদিন ওর সাথে আমার মাঝখানে আর ছিল না তবে রিসেন্টলি আবার যোগাযোগ শুরু হয়েছে আর কি তো প্রোফাইল দেখলাম ও রিসেন্ট এর আগে তুমি ওয়েনস জয়েন করতে কয়েক কত বছর না আর তার আগে বোধহয় অন্য একটা কাজ ছিল এবং সে সেশন এর আগে মেইনলি কাজ করে এবং সবাই তো প্রোফাইল দেখছেন আপনারা সবাই ও প্রোফাইল তো সাবমিট করা হয়েছে যতক্ষণ মনে পড়ে অন্যটা কথা বলি তো আমার ইন্ট্রোডাকশন দিতে আমাকে তোমার কোনটা বোর্ডে ফার্স্ট ছিল তুমি না সাইফুল্লাহ কোন একটা বোর্ডে রেকর্ড মার্কস ছিল আমি সেকেন্ড আর থার্ড ছিল একবার মেট্রিক এর সেকেন্ড আর ইন্টারমিডিয়েট থার্ড যেসব মানে খুব আমি যখন মানে আমি যখন বইটা আসে তখন দেখে ভয় লাগতো দেখতে মানে খুব হাই মানে সব ফার্স্ট আর সেকেন্ড সাইফুল্লাহ এর মধ্যে ছিল একবার ফার্স্ট একবার সেকেন্ড থার্ড ছিল বোধহয় তো হাইলি কোয়ালিফাইড ছিল আলহামদুলিল্লাহ তো এখনো সে খুব ভালো করছে বেশ এবং দেখলাম অনেক ভালো পাবলিকেশন আছে অনেক ভালো ভালো জায়গা সে এটা হিসেবে আছে সো আশা করি তার টপটা সবার জন্য ভালো লাগবে এবং স্কুল হবে তো আমি আর বেশি কথা বলছি না সাইফুল্লাহকে শুরু করার জন্য আমি রিকোয়েস্ট করছি সাইফুল্লাহ শুরু করেন স্যার ওকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আমি একটু সুযোগ নেই সাইফুল্লাহ হচ্ছে পাবলিকেশন थैंक यू শারিয়ার সাইফুল্লাহ হচ্ছে হি হ্যাজ আ লট অফ গুড পাবলিকেশনস ইনক্লুডিং ইন ট্রানজেকশন আইটিপলি ট্রানজেকশনস and uh, good venues like scm mobihawk i uh, icnp uh, census and uh, he served uh, as a uh, committee member tpc member in different uh, um, con- in very well reputed conferences in um, in network and uh, cyber physical systems uh, and network and communications sapul so, is very uh, we are very proud of you এবং আমরা গতবার হচ্ছে এনসিসি তাকে রিকোয়েস্ট করে হচ্ছে কি আমরা টিপিসি মেম্বার নিয়েছিলাম তো এবং ওয়াইন স্টেটে আছে তো ঠিক আছে সাইফুল্লাহ তোমার টকটা দাও আমরা এনজয় করব ওকে তো ইয়া थैंक यू ডক্টর মাহমুদ নাজদিন এন্ড আমার বন্ধু ফাজল थैंक यू ফর ইন্ট্রোডিউসিং সো টুডেস টক ইজ অন লো পাওয়ার ওয়াইড এরিয়া নেটওয়ার্ক so this is a relatively new term in networking basically this term its acronym is lp1 and it was introduced like 5 6 years ago and today i'll i'll present particularly lp1 in tv tv band tv white spaces and this is a lp1 that we have designed in our own lab so first let's see the motivation of lp1 why do you need lp1 so i think many of many of us may be familiar with the term called wide area wireless sensor network so sensor networks everybody is familiar with this a wide area sensor network means there are many applications where we need to deploy sensor network in extremely big areas like if we consider applications like urban sensing environmental monitoring like precision agriculture large civil infrastructure monitoring especially if you take precision agriculture like in the united states there are agricultural fields in oregon and in many other states on every side these fields are like several hundred like kilometers long similarly like large oil field like east texas oil field it has like in one side is 74 kilometer and on other side is like approximately 10 kilometers so as you can see these fields are extremely large so if you want to uh implement automated monitoring and control in this type of applications then we need to deploy hundreds of thousands of sensors so this figure as you can see here this figure i took this figure from the green orb project in in china which is an environmental monitoring monitoring project as you can see in this large area to cover this large area they had to deploy hundreds of thousands of sensors now let's see how what the what what we have today as the existing technology for wireless sensor network so we have 802.15.4 based technology we have wifi we have bluetooth so a common characteristics of these technologies is that they have they have pretty short trends like typically 30 meters 40 meters maybe at, at most 50 meters so if we want to deploy a wireless sensor network based on these technologies then we have to deploy a multi hop network like like the previous application this application field can be in terms of network deployment can be like this so we have hundreds of thousands of sensors and they are creating a multi hop network so multi hop network if you are familiar with experiences i mean real 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 life experiences with multi hop network you should know that this is extremely challenging so we can actually solve many theoretical problems it's very interesting but actually in real deployment we face a lot of engineering challenges so that's why 
like it's managed like at the cost of like energy, like expense and money and complexity. And this severely limits the scalability of this type of applications. So that's why the notion of LPON actually came. So where we want to replace the multi-hub network just with a single hub network where we have extremely long bands. So in this slide, so we just, we are running a like very short simulation. So don't ask me about the details of the simulation. This is just a very straightforward simulation running in Coalit, where we want to replace multi-hub wireless sensor network with LP1, single hub. Okay, and we are considering for the wireless sensor network, we are considering a very energy efficient MAC protocol, which is a MAC developed by University of Michigan and UC Berkeley here. So if we consider a MAC protocol for tra traditional wireless sensor network, and if we consider a very simple MAC protocol and we consider LP1, then as you can see for just converse cost scenario, which means they're collecting data from all the nodes, the first figure shows the average energy consumption, the second figure shows the latency. So the red curve shows the latency and energy for LP1 and the, the dotted black curve shows the same thing for traditional wireless sensor network using, the, using a very energy efficient MAC protocol like AMAC. As you can see, in traditional wireless sensor network, latency and energy increases almost linearly while the, the both metric remain almost steady in LP1. So that's why, like, it's pretty understandable. Like, that means, like, we if we can have some technology like LP1, where we can replace the multi-hub network with a single hub network, our performance network performance will be extremely, extremely good. So that's why that concept of technology of LP1 came. So currently, at this point, actually, there are many competing technologies. So I'll just give three names here that that are pretty well known. One is called NB-IoT, and Sigfox and LoRa. So NB IoT is narrowband IoT, which is an LP1, very new LP1. It's still not very complex, it's still under development. And this NB IoT operates over existing cellular infrastructure. So it actually operates in the license. And so if you use NB IoT, you have to pay. And also it depends on large infrastructure, costly infrastructure. That means if you go to rural areas, urban areas, remote areas, so NB IoT cannot be used because it depends on that infrastructure. The other two famous LPN technologies are Sigfox and LoRa, which are pretty similar. Sigfox is like, it's not open, but LoRa is open. And both Sigfox and LoRa now, are now pretty well known, but uh, they are actually, uh, they have to follow like extremely low duty cycle, especially in Australia and Europe. And also it's only for very light, very like simple communication. It's very low traffic, extremely low traffic communication. And they actually, Achieve the scalability considering that very low traffic. And we designed an LP1, which we named SNOW. So SNOW means sensor network over white space. So white space is the TV white space, that is the unused TV band, television band. And in United States in 2019, FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, actually gave permission for the secondary users to use the unused TV channels. That means actually a pretty high, like huge amount of band band is allocated for TV, but if you go in urban uh, suburb areas, remote areas, like TV spectrum is not used that much. If like most of the TV channels are free. So previously, like previously means like before 2009, it was illegal to use any unused TV channel, but starting from 2009, like the secondary users, other users can use the TV channel. Other means the non-TV users. They can use the TV channels as a secondary user. But you have to respect the primary users. Primary users are the wireless microphones and the televisions. So if there is any primary user active at any time, then you have to back up the channel immediately. So this is kind of dynamic spectrum. So we want to exploit this TV spectrum for LP on or for, for sensor network applications. So advantage, first advantage that we get is the long transmission range because it's lower band. So actually, then we can actually cover long areas, pretty big, large areas uh, with, with TV band. And the second key advantage is it is widely available. Widely available, especially in rural and remote areas. As you can see in this figure that they collected this data from the spectrum Ds. The x-axis shows the different like 51 channels on TV. And y-axis shows the number of counties where this channel is available as free or as, as white space. As you can see in large number of TV channels are available in many, many areas. So we want to grab this free resource. 
So, but it's not actually, it does not come free. I mean, like it's, it's highly challenging to use this for LP1. One challenge is that using TV transmission is extremely costly in terms of energy. So, we, but wireless sensor network like devices are power hungry, it's power, uh, power energy constraints. So they're pretty like a small devices. So they're not that powerful. So we have to be very, very energy efficient if we want to exploit TV channel for sensor networking. And also we need to like provide a scalability here. Then other challenges like long range. Long range is, is an advantage, but it also gives you a lot of problems because that means you are actually interfering so many things and you are also being interfered by so many things. So, so we are not the first to use uh, TV white space. So people already started using TV white space, but most of the existing work are for broadband service, like Microsoft Research started first using white space, but including that use and all other uses, the uses are mainly for broadband. So they are actually, there is no concept of energy efficiency, but we need to be very, very energy efficient. So that's why it's extremely challenging if you want to adopt it for TV1. So this figure shows the architecture of SNOW. As you can see here, we have one base station that is connected to the internet. And then we have these nodes are here. And all these nodes are directly connected to the base station. So that means the nodes can directly communicate with the base station. So because this is a single hub network and nodes can actually, it can be like seven miles, eight miles away from the base station. And the base station has to be internet connected. It can be near office, it can be near home, anywhere, where typically have internet. And the, the purpose of internet connection is to determine the white space, because if, if you have to give the location, location, geographic location, and then give that location in a white space database, then you need to the white space channels, because all the primary users in the United States, they have to register. If they're the primary user, then have to register against their location. Then you give your location, you understand which channels are available there. So then the base station determines the channel in the entire, entire network, uh, the three channels, then the entire spectrum, whatever spectrum that you determine that you want to use, you use the entire, entire spectrum as just a single channel as the base station. As you can see this figure, in this figure, this indicates the entire channel, just one just single channel at the base station. Then you split the channels, is split this spectrum into narrow, narrow subcarriers. So each subcarrier means a very narrow channel. Then you assign the narrow channel, as you can see in this figure, you assign one narrow channel or one subcarrier to every node. And these nodes are power constrained. They don't do a spectrum sensing or cloud access. So basically to determine white space, you have two ways to do. So one way is to do the cloud access, that the method I have just explained that you, 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 you through the internet connection, you will check with the location in the, in the cloud. The other approach is to do a spectrum sensing if you don't have internet connection. A spectrum sensing may just through sensing you determine if there is any primary user or there is no primary user. Okay, but the spectrum sensing is extremely like energy consuming. So we don't, so this here in our design, the nodes don't have to do anything. So we, we determine the white space only through the base station and base station determines white space also on behalf of the nodes. And these nodes are power constant. They operate on the assigned narrow subcarriers. So our goal in this design is to achieve parallel receptions at the base station using a single radio. So parallel reception means if you know about wireless, in wireless using a single radio or a single channel, you can actually receive at most one transmission at a time. But here, we want to enable many parallel receptions. That means the base station will just use one channel, one channel, and on that channel, for example, if you have 100 subcarriers, 100 nodes can transmit at the same time, and the base station should be able to receive all 100 transmissions at the same time using single radio. And also we want asynchronous transmissions from the nodes. That means when the nodes want to transmit, they can transmit autonomously. They don't, don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to decide when I will transmit, when you will transmit. So whenever they need to transmit, they want to transmit. So you want this also. So that's why we design our physical layer based on, based on a distributed implementation of OFDM. So OFDM is, means orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. 
if you see the first figure, first figure shows traditional FDM, the frequency division multiplexing, where if you consider the whole thing here as a spectrum, then the spectrum is split into sub into channels or subcarriers, okay? And here, as you can see, the spectrums, every color indicates one subcarrier, one division. And the two subcarriers or two channels are not interfering, not overlapping. So this is the traditional FDM. But the OFDM means we do the same thing, but here, the second figure, as you can see, the channels are overlapping. So traditionally, two overlapping channels, if two nodes transmit on two overlapping channels to the same, to the same receiver, then the reception fails. They are gonna interfere each other. But if you use, if you create the sub-channels or if you create the channels or sub-carriers using the theory of orthogonality, then two nodes can transmit simultaneously without interfering each other. So theory of orthogonality means they are orthogonal here, which means if the uh, integration over a time period, integration of the two signals, sorry, integration of the product of the two, two signals over a time period is zero, then two signals are equal orthogonal. So in this way, we determine the orthogonal signals and we determine the orthogonal subcarriers. Okay, so this is called OFDM, but this is traditional OFDM that is typically used between one transmitter and one receiver. But here in this design, we use a distributed implementation of OFDM, while the nodes will, the nodes in the sensor network will like distributively transmit on their own subcarriers. So nodes transmit on narrow subcarriers and which actually gives us energy efficient spectrum efficiency. Spectrum efficiency is very clear from these figures. As you can see, if we use OFDM, we can actually afford, we can create many, many subcarriers. And this is also extremely energy efficient because we are actually using extremely narrow subcarriers. And you know, for uh, wireless transmission, the energy is consumed by every hertz. So the narrower the uh, spectrum, the narrower the band, the narrower the channel, the lower is the energy consumption. Since we use extremely narrow channels, it becomes highly energy efficient. Then every individual subcarrier is modulated. In our design, we use ASK or BPSK. ASK is the amplitude modulation or amplitude shift, uh, shift king and BPSK is binary phase shift king. Actually, we can use like even different modulation for different nodes, but we use like homogeneous the same modulation for every node here in our design. Then the nodes asynchronously transmit to the base station and the base station can simultaneously receive and which gives higher skill in, in the design. Then how do we adopt DOM? We call it DOFDM, the distributed implementation of OFDM. Then how do we adopt this? The distributed orthogonal signals from the sensor nodes are coming and are being received by the base station. So these signals are orthogonal because they are transmitted on orthogonal subcarriers. Now, if you consider here, this green color here, that the first node transmits the green signal. Okay, this signal is received at the base station is shown here. Then the second node transmits on yellow, yellow color signal. As you can see, this signal is here. Okay, so this is received on the corresponding uh, spectrum in the base station, okay? And the yellow color that you can see on the other parts, those are just interference on the nearby subcarriers. Similarly, the blue signal here is being sent from node three, the third node. As you can see, the blue signal is here, is received on the same part, on the corresponding part uh, in the spectrum at the base station and the others are interference here. So when the nodes, all nodes are transmitting like this on its every node is transmitting on its individual subcarrier, then you see here the composite signal, okay? This is the aggregate OFDM signal, okay? That is received at the base station. This signal can be represented in time to just like this figure. Those who work on network can be familiar with this equation here. We have two parts here. One is the first part is the I signal. The second part is called the Q signal. And here, the T is the time, that means if we just put the time, you can get the time the time sample, like time domain sample. Okay, and K here, K means the corresponding, the which component or which signal component, which frequency you're considering. So if this signal, the composite signal is received at the base station, then the base station has to, has to decode, has to decode the data for every individual node, what was sent from node one, what was sent from node two. And 
to decode this, the nodes actually need to be strongly time synchronized. But strong time synchronization is a very difficult problem, especially, especially in this, this type of design where we consider extremely low power devices. The devices are extremely energy constrained, so it's very difficult to uh, receive, to achieve uh, tight synchronization. So we avoid that complexity, we avoid that complexity and leave all the complexity of the, uh, the base station. I mean, we keep the nodes extremely simple. So the other challenges are here are inner symbol interference. In inner symbol interference is like traditional, like it's a traditional like interference, the like common interference in, in wireless. In any wireless combination, we have inter symbol interference. We also have the same thing here, which means that because we send the symbols and the one symbol actually interferes with the subsequent symbols. So we actually, and this is actually a little more pronounced here because too many nodes are transmitting the base station. So we use a technical bit spreading here to handle this. The like traditional technique used in wireless combination is called cyclic, cyclic prefix. And we, instead of that, we use the bit spreading to make it much, much simpler and also more effective. And bit spreading means if you send bit one, if that one bit is converted to one symbol, then we just repeat that symbol, for example, seven times or two times or eight times. And that actually gives an effect similar to like extended cyclic prefix. And that's why like, you can see, like since we are repeating the bits and the actual number of bits thrown in the air is called like that rate is called cheap rate. And actually the effective bit rate becomes lower than cheap rate, but it gives high reliability of communication. Other challenge is intercarrier interference. Intercarrier interference means this sub, if you go back to the previous figure, this subcarriers, as you can see here, this subcarrier, the reception of this subcarrier interferes the nearby subcarriers. And this is, this is called intercarrier interference. And this is extremely highly pronounced in, in OFDM based design. This is in a special domain because the subcarriers are interfering the subcarriers. And this stems from the from like carrier frequency offset and carrier frequency offset is it, it happens because of the non ideality of the devices and also because of the movement of the devices. So this actually violates this creates the problem in orthogonality because theoretically we choose the orthogonal channels, orthogonal subcarriers, but in practice due to CFO or carrier frequency offset, the subcarriers don't remain orthogonal. So that means that's why they are interfering each other. And this is a little tricky to handle in our design, but for the time being, let's forget it. So I'll actually come to this ICA later subsequently. So if you forget about the CF, all those things, then the decoding is just like this. We have that composite signal here at the receiver. And this time domain samples, we keep the time domain samples and pass through a serial to parallel converter. And this is fed into a global FFT algorithm. We call it FFT, global FFT is the first Fourier transformation. We call it global because at the base station, the FFT is run on the entire spectrum here. All the way receiving on different subcarriers. So once we run the FFT here, then the time domain samples are converted into frequency domain. And frequency domain, we select the beans, just the center frequencies of the subcarriers. Then we get the data on each subcarrier. As you can see here in this matrix, this is uh, y-axis is in the time, is time. As you can see the bits received here on every subcarrier shown on every column. And this shows some asynchrony because the nodes can transmit asynchronously. So for example, if, if you see on the first column, this is the first bit received on the first subcarrier. And at this time on the second column, this is the first bit received on the second subcarrier. So nodes, so this actually shows that we are receiving as, asynchronously from the, um, from the nodes. Okay, so what we have explained in this uplink communication and then how about downlink communication? We also want downlink combination. It has to be like multi-transmission. So multi, this multi-transmission does not mean like a broadcast, like traditional broadcast. Traditional broadcast means the base station transmits the same thing to every node. But here we don't want that. We want using a single antenna radio. The base station will transmit different things to different nodes. So different data to different nodes using a single transmission. And we want bi-directional communication. That means we want to 
concurrent, enable concurrently like uplink communication and downlink communication. And again, both uplink and downlink should be fully asynchronous. For example, downlink communication can be for just for acknowledgement, right? Because whatever you receive from the base station, the base, uh, so from the nodes, the base station has to acknowledge. And for all these purposes, for both downlink communication and uplink communication, you want to achieve using single antenna. And single antenna is very, very important because we are operating in low frequency and low frequency, usually antenna becomes, the form factor becomes a little bigger, bigger, higher, because it's low frequency. And also this special advantage of single antenna is that for low frequency, uh, the distance that we have to maintain between the antennas should be pretty long. Like it should be at least like half of the uh, wavelength. So that's is very important that we use single antenna. So then to achieve simultaneous transmission reception at the base station, we use two radios at the base station. One is called RX radio that is dedicated for reception only. The other is called TX radio that is dedicated for transmission. It's only used for transmission. And every radio uses one antenna, just single antenna here. Yeah. But again, so here the nodes, every node uses just one hub duplex radio when one single antenna and one hub duplex radio. That means it cannot both transmit and receive at the same time and it can receive at most one at a time. So for downlink communication, the base station encodes different data on different sub carriers, what we have already mentioned. And this is different from traditional broadcast. And for transmitting, it performs an inverse Fourier transformation. That's how actually it converted because it takes data from all the sub carriers, from all the channels, but then it is converted into time domain signal. And that becomes an OFDM signal. Then the OFDM signal is broadcast, is transmitted. Then from the received OFDM signal, a node independently decodes data from the signal components on its own sub carrier. So the MAC protocol, I'll not like explain the details of this MAC protocol is usually very simple here. So the first we determine the white space in, a, in, in the network area, then white space spectrum is split into orthogonal sub carriers and each node is assigned a sub carrier. Now when the number of nodes is higher than the sub carriers, then a sub carrier is shared. So usually consider like hundreds of thousands of nodes to support here, but we may not have that many sub carriers. So that means the sub carriers will be, will be shared. So that's how you do a location or sub carrier allocation, which means like um, if based on the location of the devices, we can actually estimate the hidden terminals, which node is hidden terminal to another node. Okay, then we try to attempt assign different sub carriers to hidden terminals. And also you want to ensure that the sub carrier is not, is not overly, overly congested. Then the MAC, the, the nodes transmit using a very simple MAC protocol, which is just based on CSMSCA and a very simple version of CSMSCA, which is adopted in tiny ways operating system. So basically it just is stat it uses a static interval, random back off instead of like variable interval. So our first implementation is on USRP devices. If you know about this USRP devices, it's called universal software radio peripheral devices, a very expensive device, typically like, like 1,000 US dollar, 2,000 US dollar, 800 US dollar, the price is like this. But good thing about USRP is that if we want to design some hardware, that's in terms of communication, okay? But we actually cannot manufacture the devices immediately. But whatever design we have, we can actually do the same. We can design in software using GNU radio, okay? And actually, and connecting the USB device with a laptop or your Raspberry Pi or any computer, we can just get the functionality of the hardware. So we basically design hardware using in software here. So our first experiment was using USB devices, which is connected to a laptop or Raspberry Pi. Then our whole physical layer is designed here. Then on top of that, it is in the Mac layer and it chips snow here. Then uh, all the packets, all the packets, like up to the number of sub carriers. If we have 200 sub carriers, then 200 nodes can transmit at the same time to the base station. And these 200 packets can be decoded just within 0 0.1 millisecond, which is just almost same as, as a single packet decoding in traditional hardware which actually gives extremely high scale. 
So we have to select some design parameters, like design parameters are bit rate, and we select target bit rate as 50 kbps, kilobits per second. We also determine packet size, which is typically very short because this is sensor network applications. Then subcarrier bandwidth and bit spreading factor are determined based on target bit rate. And also we explore the Shannon Hartley theorem and Nike's theorem. And also we see the experience in exp experiment and then we determine these things. So our default settings for the experiment were zero dBm transmission power. And subcarrier bandwidth was 400 kilohertz. Basis channel bandwidth was just one TV channel. This is in the default experiment. One TV channel in the US is six megahertz wide. And packet size we used 40 bytes and beta spreading factor we used eight. This is our default setup. And we for our first ex deployment was in the Detroit metropolitan area. This was our uh, like typical deployment with using use, use up implementation. And as you can see here, this is for two bit communication between two nodes. We try to see how far we can go. So we go, we actually vary transmission power starting from zero dBm to 20 dBm. The 20 dBm is typically used in LP1. Today's LP1, like in, in Seek, Fox, LoRa, they use 20 dBm, which is very low transmission power. So here, zero dBm means like it's equivalent to one milliwatt transmission power. Similarly, you can convert 20 dBm. You can see here using 20 dBm, we can go up to eight kilometers, which is extremely long, right? Because if you compare this with traditional, uh, traditional wireless sensor network, traditional wireless sensor network use typical transmission for zero dBm. So zero dBm here, we can go up to two kilometers, two kilometers where typically in wireless sensor network or even Wi-Fi network, you can go up to like 30, 40 meters only. So you see how long combination as we can achieve here. So this figure shows reliability in uplink and downlink and using, uh, and we varied uh, the bandwidth of the subcarriers. And this is using zero dBm transmission power. As you can see, Y axis shows the average correctly decoding rate. The higher the rate, better is the reliability. So as you can see, our reliability is pretty high in both uplink and downlink. And this was outdoor experiment. We also run some experiment indoor in the campus. Basically, this is inside the computer science building because traditionally, like indoor communication is extremely hard for wireless. <clears throat> yeah. And the, the larger the number of walls between co the, the between the sender and receiver, the worse is the communication. But here you can see, even when we have up to seven walls, and every wall was like 12, 12 inches, it's concrete wall. Even we have seven walls, we can achieve, we can have like packet decoding rate up to all, more than 98%, which means even in indoor, like it is very reliable. And it makes sense because it's actually low band and, and the low band actually can easily penetrate the walls. Then we compared with LoRa. LoRa, as I said, LoRa is a very like well-known LP1 technology. Basically, LoRa was designed in parallel with Snow. Like when we started designing Snow, we did not know the term even LoRa. We knew the term once we actually completed our initial design. So then once we completed, so at that point, so we did not have any LoRa devices. It was very new at that time. And so we just compared uh, in simulation, in coordinate simulation here, and LoRa, and snow comparison here, as you can see, we are considering data collection and the first figure shows the energy consumption and second figure shows the latency here. So we consider the same width of the band used in LoRa gateway and used in snow gateway. And here you can see the blue curve shows the performance curve for LoRa while the red curve shows the performance curve for snow and both energy consumption and latency are like pretty steady in snow while it's increasing slightly as we increase the number of nodes in LoRa, which means like snow is even like more scalable compared to LoRa. So our first implementation was on based on USRP device. As I already mentioned, it's a very expensive device. And we had like around like 15, 19 devices in the lab. And every device is at least like $800 US dollar cost. It can be even like $2,000, $1,500. Okay. So that means like, this is not practical. Like it's, people cannot use this, right? It's very costly. So that's why, and I also like my lab actually cannot design the uh, hardware. So you're not expert in designing hardware also. So that's why what we did. We use some 
uh, like TI devices where physical layer is programmable. So you can hack the physical layer. So you do CC1310, that's one device, another device you take CC1330. So for both of the devices, they're pretty cheap devices, 30 US dollar. I think it's re retail price is 30, but if you list, uh, like buy in bulk, it can be like few dollars only. So in these devices, the physical layer is programmable. So since in our snow design, we had one thing, that the snow nodes are extremely simple so because it's very simple so we can actually take these devices like cc1310 and make it a snow device so it that means like we actually implemented our physical layer on cc1310 and then we ran some experiment again so and you can see this figure this figure shows the cost it very makes sense that if we use usb devices the cost increases as, as the number of nodes increases cost is like the this curve that linearly increases while if we just use cc1310 the cost like in doesn't increase that much it's affordable and cc1310 implementation was not a straightforward it's not like we can just take the usb implementation implement implement on on CC13, it's not like that. We actually have, because these are the low cost devices, very cheap devices. So we face a lot more problems here. So one problem was, is called peak to average power ratio. Uh, it's pretty well known problem in communication and networking. It's called PAPR problem. How we handle this, I don't feel like I can, I can cover this in just one talk. We also like need to improve the performance of communication using general state information. That part also I'll skip in the talk. And then the third part that CF that I already mentioned that ICI is heavily pronounced in small. And for USB implementation, we did not need to do any ICA because uh, USB devices were almost ideal, pretty close to ideal. So that's why the performance was extremely good even without ICA compensation. <laughs> but when we go to the implementation of 1310, we had to handle that ICI. So we needed to like estimate the KDF frequency offset and we had to compensate for it. So I'll, slide, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about CFO estimation and compensation. The other part was near far problem that there's a new problem that we faced in, in the deployment and I'll just explain how we handle that. So this is the CF estimation. So CF estimation, the base station calculates the KDF frequency offset of CFO for each node independently. And we have to do this during the node joining because CF estimation becomes very difficult in our design because we really don't find any sub carrier where the sub carrier that is interference free because any sub because we have like so many overlapping sub carriers every sub carrier interferes the nearby sub carriers. That's how we have to do it only during the joining phase and we have to select a special sub carrier that is far away from the other sub carriers. That joint sub is, is ICI, inter interference free. And on that sub carrier, we first determine the CFO and then, again, so that CFO is determined based on the data aided estimation that we do actually using in preamble. So we have two parts in the preamble. Using short preamble first, we determine the course estimation. We do the course estimation of CFO and that course estimation is used for the second part of the preamble to do a final CF estimation, which is finally used in addition to the Doppler effect. If you have any movement, we take the Doppler effect. And this, as you see the last expression here, so this is the compensation that we have to do. This compensation means like this much violation can happen in when you transmit, when a node transmits. This center frequency can change by this much value. It's either on left or on right. If it changes on the right, then the node proactively actually make the transmission a little bit on the left side. So this is how I do the, so this is feedback based approach of CF estimation. So I, I don't think I'll explain all details of this. I'll just stop CF estimation here. The other, other problem is near far problem that we faced in our real deployment here. Near far problem is if you can, if you can take a look on the left figure here, just consider two nodes node A and node B are transmitting and they're using two overlapping subcarriers or nearby subcarriers. Now, if node A is pretty close to the base station, then its signal, as you can see in the second figure, its main signal is here, that green signal. And its own subcarrier is strongest. 
And as you can see here, it also has its this frequency is leaking and it's actually interfering on the nearby subcarrier that is that is to be used by node B. But node B is pretty far away from the base station. So node B's signal is buried by the interference signal of node A. That means this is called near far problem. So that means the legitimate signal can be buried by interfering signal. So that's how like we, we have to handle this in our design because this is a special problem that we face in face in snow. And whole technique I'll not be designing, just, just giving an idea how it is. We actually adopted a, a feedback-based approach where we use adaptive transmission power control. So this based on the feedback from the base station, the nodes just adjust, adjust the transmission powers to 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 fight against the NFR problem. And then we deployed the same thing that CC1310 based uh, in implementation. We deployed this in the Detroit area. And I'll just show one curve here, the performance curve in terms of throughput. As you can see here, as we increase the number of nodes, as we increase the number of nodes, our throughput increases. But the first curve here, that yellow curve shows, if we don't do any compensation, if we don't do CSI, if we don't do CFO, okay, then this is our performance. So we get bit better performance if we actually estimate the channel and we, and we should also estimate the uh, frequency offset and compensate for it. Then our performance increases. Then the third curve, the blue curve shows if we do the channel, step, uh, channel estimation, then frequency offset estimation and compensate for it. And also if we do the uh, near, if we handle the near for problem using the ATPC technique, the adaptive transmission power control, then we get much, much better performance here. So that's all about some implementations. I just gave only very high level presentation of our technical things. I cannot explain the whole technical design in just one talk. But anyway, so Sono is a promising platform for LP1 technology for IoT applications, and it's highly scalable, as we have seen. Our next goal for Sono is to make it also usable for other bands, like Currently, we are using only the TB band, but actually, it can also be implemented for ISM band. Then, we also want to like add features like security, mobility, and also coexistence. And finally, we also want to commercialize our product. And there is plenty of options for for future work. So, I want to thank to National Science Foundation through these grants that supported this research, and also like Rumble Fellowship and other internal grants from Wayne State University and also Microsoft Research who also partially supported this research. And we had collaborators. Uh, the main collaborator, the student collaborator was in the Mahbubu Rahman who is also a Buet student. He actually graduated from Buet. He just completed his PhD and he is now an assistant professor at City University of New York. He just joined this semester like a few days ago. Other students, Delhi is mine. He is currently a PhD student. Then Venkata Modikutti, who, who also worked on this project a little bit, who also just graduated and he is now a professor at University of Nevada. And my other collaborators were from Microsoft Research. With this, I'll conclude my talk and I have a very short advertisement for the students because I have an opening for multiple PhD students. If you know any PhD student who are interested to work in real-time embedded systems, area. By the way, I need to mention that uh, our lab is extremely like, it's very good, especially like when it's university, like real-time embedded system lab is, uh, lab is like world-renowned, like we have ranked even like sixth in the United States and 11th across the world. It's a very renowned lab. So if, if students want to work in real-time and embedded system, please, and they are interested to do research in my lab, just uh, contact me. We also work on low power wide area network, the IoT and cyber physical systems. So students can contact me directly through my email. All right, so that's my last slide. If you have any question, please feel free to ask me. Uh, thank you so much, Sakula Bhai. Karo kono question ba comment thakle either hand raise korle hobe ba chat e likhle hobe. Ha, Rajiv Bhai. Assalamualaikum. Thanks to the speaker. 
and probably I'm very unfortunate. I missed the starting part of the uh, uh, speech, I guess, the presentation. So uh, my question is, uh, how can we evaluate or uh, what would be the impact of environmental effect on LoRa and snow? So which one, which one uh, better sustains under different types of environmental effects, for example, high temperature, rain, fog, or in, in case of USA, probably snowing, something like that. So any idea on the environmental effects and sustainability over there? So in terms of environment, there should not be any difference between two devices because this depends on how resilient your device is, is against the environmental effects, right? So there is no effect like on the physical layer implementation or other protocol layer implementation. It only depends on how we design the devices because for Sono, we really have not built any devices of our own, okay? We have only used USB devices and we have only used like TI devices, okay? But all those devices are already resilient. You can actually put in the environment, okay? But whenever you put in the environment, yeah, if it's raining, then the, any device, if it's LoRa, it's, gonna, it's not gonna work. If it's uh, TI devices, it's not gonna work, but you have to use some covering, okay? You have to use some covering, like plastic covering. Oh, and, oh, probably and, I cannot make my question clear. So in, in case of uh, the coverage, that is the transmission list, uh, range or distance, that uh, snow can cover and you have shown us with very uh, beautiful figures graphs that it can go up to 20 days dbm power mm -hmm. for around eight kilometers that's pretty high compared to lora because getting a distance of one kilometer or at most two kilometers within the line of sight having the, a very good uh, lora device is very difficult we have already experienced that but my, my question is in case of different environmental situations for example having rain or in extreme temperature, these are some different cases when uh, what I have faced in my real life that the coverage becomes changed, drastically changed. So in case of mm -hmm. rain, probably the coverage is not same. Or even in case of USA while snowing, even we do some sort of indoor experiment that, that gets impacted the, uh, by the outdoor snowing. I, I have already experienced that. So whatever I have experienced, that was over Wi-Fi. But while doing some experiment with LoRa, we are yet to do any experiment with different environmental conditions. But as you have shown many things and you have done indoor experiments, outdoor experiments, great things. So I was just wondering whether you have experimented in different environmental conditions, anything like that, for example, snowing or raining? Yeah, we experiment actually. We have even some experiment because like here in Michigan, actually it's pretty cold, right? And it snows a lot, like three, four months. Yes. Yes, that's a pretty good question. So actually, you know, the snow, snow is kind of water, right? So water is the worst thing for wireless communication. That's why during the snow, when it snows or it rains, the wireless communication actually degrades severely. It's, it's going to happen both for LoRa and also for actually for, for, for snow. But you will get better performance in snow. The main reason is if you, if you remember the band of LoRa, Compared to that band, the snow band is much, much lower frequency, right? It's, it starts at 54 megahertz. So because of the lower frequency, lower frequency actually can easily penetrate any obstacle. So that's why you'll get slightly better performance than LoRa, okay? But any type of wireless communication, they will be severely affected by, by snow or raining or any other obstacle. It's just more or less based on the frequency used. Great. Thank that answers the question? It's a great presentation, Saifullah. I, I, I have a very nice question. I don't know whether <laughs> I should ask this one. So uh, what do you uh, do for your research? Do you uh, build prototype or just uh, uh, do some simulations or some uh, lab things? Uh, when As you have some big <clears throat> data and real-time applications. Okay, as you can see in my sum of the experiment that you have explained, so we actually do the real implementation, okay? First of all, like my, my area is pretty wide, even if it's real-time system research, if it's a wireless or embedded system. For most of the things, actually, we, we do the real experiment. And we have actually our own test bed in the campus that is actually spread in the campus, okay? For wireless and IoT, for even for Sono, we have a test bed. So everything yeah. that we do, we actually do the real implementation on the test bed. But many times we also have to run simulation because for test bed experience, there are so many limitations. It takes a long time. Also, there is like device uh, limitation, right? We have limited number of devices. But when you want to test with tens of thousands of nodes, then we have to run simulation. 
yeah well, that's the that's the thing actually i i, I was wondering i'm wondering that uh, i mean what maybe the size of your test bed i mean for a good uh, i mean uh, for a good support and what is the optimal size for your test bed Okay, currently Excel, we have 130 nodes. 130 nodes, but those are actually different sensor, sensor nodes, okay? We have 130 nodes and- It's a heterogeneous different type of, different types of sensors, right? Right, right, right. And you know, you can actually, if you have, if you go to my page, I actually have a link to my test, but previously it was actually like publicly accessible, but recently for some problems, like it's disconnected, it's not gonna work right now. So we previously actually made it available or worldwide. So any people can actually use our test bed, okay? But recently we faced some problems, but we actually, right now people cannot use it, but it was usable before. And so we had that 130 sensor nodes, then we have around, I cannot, I don't remember the exact figure. We have LPN devices, maybe around 35 or 40 and we are actually still working to in, uh, like extend okay. that. Okay. Uh, uh, now my next question: uh, If uh, suppose we have some algorithm or protocol, so if we request uh, to use your, I mean, uh, use the test bed, if we request you, I mean, is it possible to uh, use that test bed? Uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, approval after your approval. Uh, as I said, yeah, previously actually many people are requesting me, like I received many requests to use the test bed. We still have the like publicly accessible website. It looks like you can use it, but actually it's disconnected slightly like from the test. At this point you can't use, but but if you want to collaborate for any of these things, like my students can use in the lab so you can collaborate and actually do implement oh, okay. here. Yeah. Hopefully and the new operating... is accessible to the people again. Yeah, yeah. So for operating system, you are using Tiny OS, right? Right. Tiny OS, now we are switching to Contiki. Oh, okay. Any other question? I think uh, uh, there is uh, no more uh, questions. Um, so, uh, so you are uh, uh, now taking new students, but the visa is <laughs> visa uh, interview is. I could talk about China. I can't even understand. Hey, visa interview is totally. Hey, because I mean, for eight to six students, I mean, Jani, I mean, already recruit course si. India. Take a recruit course. Si. Oh, ora, India. Take a ora ora khule chena. Acha. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jani, I mean, letter issue kori na. I mean, final. Funding letter. We can go over. Can I come too early? Or join to follow it. It's still too early for visa application. Okay. But our next follow is our join to the problem. Hopefully by January, everything should be okay. Yeah, inshallah. I'm not a time on it. So it will be weather to be thick to cut up or key. Bunny yet a Michigan to Tanda. You said maximum party chant up. No, it's not a big problem. It's not a good day. So, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Yeah, right. Tanda is not a problem, right? So, everybody. Agdomina. Agdomina actually, it's not a good day. Most of the East Coast is not a good day. East Coast is not a good day. Right. It's a good thing. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. Ashole Amra a talk series to seminar series to Shuru Kuretilam, so Vish Koyak Mashuegalo, Abung Bane Amra Shabaki invite Kutsi, so Akonik to Jeta Hochi Aki, Agaro Bishi participation Chilo, Akoni student that the class should be getting to Buddha test test to Hoche, so Yerki, so Bane Dupashi Yerki, Akonij semester Agam Jorishore Shurhuse. So Ajo Nonishomai to Monahoche Jatke to Pom. Usually, Aro Thakirki. So, Kubhalalo, Yaki Shadia Katsi, Naman, Shadia, both in Amaji Chulagats, <laughs> Namaji Tanto, Kurisumadi Akonopani, timing Takirkom. So, the Marcojun PhD student at Yamanakun currently, how many? Three Tinjon Astem, Dujon graduate holes at Kabuli Belhoek, active as a Tinjon, three students. So, I request request if possible collaboration. 
এটা হচ্ছে বলে খুব ভালো হয় তাই না হ্যাঁ কিউ ম্যাডাম আমি অলওয়েজ ওপেন সো হ্যাঁ না আমরা হচ্ছে কি আমরা তো আর কি সাহস পাই না যে কারণ ওই লেভেলে কাজ করানো তো খুব মুশকিল তাই না আমাদের এখানে তো সবই ইয়া মানে তারপরে আন্ডার গ্রাজুয়েট স্টুডেন্টদের তো আমরা ভালো পাই এটা একটা ব্যাপার তবে সমস্যা যেটা হয় ওদেরকে রেডি করতে করতে মুশকিল হয়ে যায় মানে রেডি করতে করতে মানে থিসিসে ধরো যেমন একটা হয়তো নতুন আমি যেমন এনডিএনএ একটা কাজ করাচ্ছি সিমুলেটর শিখতে শিখতে কিন্তু বছর শেষ হয়ে যায় তারপরে আবার ওইটা দিয়ে কাজ করানো বা ওইখানে একটা ইমপ্রুভমেন্ট করা খুব ডিফিকাল্ট হয়ে দাঁড়ায় আর মাস্টার্স এর স্টুডেন্টদেরকে দিয়ে করানো যায় কিন্তু এখন ইদানিং আবার মাস্টার্স এর স্টুডেন্টরা নেটওয়ার্কের কাজগুলোতে করতে যাচ্ছে না বেশিরভাগ দেখা যায় যে বাট নেটওয়ার্কে অনেক মেশিন লার্নিং এর ব্যাপার আছে তাই না তো বেশিরভাগই দেখা যায় যে অনেকে অ্যাপ্লাইড মেশিন লার্নিং বা ওই যে হিউম্যান কম্পিউটার ইন্টারঅ্যাকশন এই দিকে একটু বেশি ঝুঁকছে হ্যাঁ এখন ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়াইড মেশিন লার্নিং এ বেশি ঝুঁকছে হ্যাঁ সেটাই বাট হচ্ছে যে আমার তো অনেক পছন্দের সাবজেক্ট রাজিরো তো সো ইনশাআল্লাহ হচ্ছে যে আমাদের দেখি হচ্ছে কি কোনো সুযোগ হয় কিনা তা আমাদের যদি অপরচুনিটি আর এরকম কোনো কি ফান্ডিং এর কাজ করা যায় আউটরিচ কোনো ফান্ড ফান্ডে যেটাতে ধরো এখানে আমরা একটু কাজ করলাম মানে যদি কাজের কোন সুযোগ আছে কাজ করলো আমি এরকম দু একটা কাজ করেছি এবং রাজিও করছে আমরা কয়েকজন করছি এবং বেশ মানে গুড আর কে ভালো আগাচ্ছে কারণ আসলে নলেজ শেয়ারিং টা তো খুব ইম্পর্টেন্ট রাইট আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে তো ভালো থেকে ওখানকার হচ্ছে কি সুস্থ থেকে কোভিড পরিস্থিতি তো মনে হচ্ছে আগের মতোই ঠিক আছে ম্যাডাম হ্যাঁ ইনশাআল্লাহ দেখা হবে কখনো যদি দেখা ঠিক আছে হ্যাঁ কখনো হচ্ছে কি হ্যাঁ ডিপার্টমেন্ট আসলে ভিজিট করো এবং ভালো থেকো সুস্থ থেকো আজকে আমরা এখানে ওয়ালাইকুম সালাম আমরা এখানে শেষ করছি